Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Want to welcome everybody. Good morning. Welcome to lunch. We love all the great conversation, just not right now. Want to welcome everybody. My name is Matt Whitaker. I'm, I'm the national chair of this event, and I serve on the Alumni Board of Governors. We're thrilled to have you all here today. It's a little tight in here. Sorry about that. It's like the last Southwest flight I was on. Take the first available seat you see, even if your back is to the speaker. But I have an idea. Maybe we could work on this. There's a sign near the door. This room holds 200 people in a banquet setting, but it actually holds 249 people if it's used as a gym. So if a few of you could grab the nearest basketball or tennis racket and start swinging or bouncing, then we can get 49 more people in here. So this is the, um, the fourth caucus that I've been part of. And we have um, developed a formula that seems to work. We, we find two dynamic, very engaged alum, and we make them our co-chairs, our regional co-chairs. And earlier this morning, you met Sheldon and Shaolin. Are they here? Maybe they could give a wave. There's Shaolin and Sheldon. Uh, he's somewhere around, I'm sure. And then we pick a, a bunch of other alums who are active and engaged and influential, and we form an advisory committee. And I want to thank all the people that served on our advisory committee for this caucus. So I'm going to call out your name. Maybe you could stand up, and then afterwards we'll do a group round of applause. Thanks to Gayen Christensen, Anjali Hack, you can just stand up when I call your name, Kelly Gushu, Thomas Hoy, Alexandra Kogod, Sammy Mugrabi, Libby Pearson, Elizabeth Roberts, Michael Roberts, Catherine Skeen, Barry Tico, and Jennifer Yeaw. Sorry for any mispronunciations. Thanks to this advisory committee. They did a great job. And we have record attendance. We've outdrawn even the last caucus that was in Chicago about three years ago. So um, what about the rest of you? Where are you all from? I know we have a massive group here from the New York area. If you're from the New York area, could I hear some noise? <laughs> Did anyone come in from Chicago? Any Chicago people here? How about uh, Boston? Did you leave your Fortress of Solitude to come here? How about Philadelphia? We got some Philadelphia. It's the Philadelphia crowd. Oh, they're pretty loud. How about um, my crowd, DC, Baltimore, Maryland? Why are you guys all sitting together? You're supposed to sit with people you don't know. But it's more effective for this. Um, going south, I know we've got North Carolina. Where's Helen? Well, there you go. And here's where we have some other people, and you can shout if you want, if you want to be recognized. I know we have someone from Florida, from Tampa. We've got, we've got um, Pittsburgh, of course, my co-chair, Lauren, and a couple of others from Pittsburgh. Come on, you can shout out if you want. Don't be shy. Be proud. We've got someone here from Mississippi. We've got, we've got Houston covered. Houston, is Houston in the house? We've got um, Arizona, Phoenix. Seattle, there we go, Seattle, that's right, be proud. Minneapolis, Minneapolis, oh, one person, welcome. All right, and, and you guys thought you had it hard. We've got, uh, Juan is here from Lima, Peru, not, not Lima, Ohio. We've got Spain represented, where are you, Spain, hey. Macedonia. Macedonia. And I think the award for the furthest travel, Beijing, sir. <laughs> Who did I miss? Dallas. Dallas? I heard Dallas. Uh, New Jersey people, I included you with either New York or Philadelphia. I'm sorry if you're offended by that, but if you want a New Jersey, let's hear from the New Jersey people. All right, wh where else? Who else did we miss? Any? Connecticut. Connecticut, okay, same. Boston, New York, Connecticut, all right. 
think we had a Western Mass. Maybe you're not. Western Mass. There you go. Anybody else? Less? Atlanta? Good. I didn't know we had Atlanta here. Did I hear L.A.? No L.A.? Okay. Very good. Anyway, so that's who we've got in the room. It's a great group. This really is a, a, a caucus. So thanks for coming. And meanwhile, we hope you enjoyed your morning sessions. We hope you learned something useful. I attended myself the um, Enhancing Your Management Skills session, which found a little painful. It's a lot of time to think about myself. And um, you know, I'm wondering, am I a problem solver, a relator, an influencer? And as I left the session and wandered up here, I remembered what I really am, and I know what I am because Bora told me this about a week ago. I am an introducer. And today I'm going to introduce the provost of the university, our lunchtime speaker. Today we're going to meet um, Eric Isaacs, the provost of the University of Chicago. Eric is a professor in the Department of Physics, the James Franck Institute, and the college, and serves as a provost of the University of Chicago with responsibility for academic and research programs across the university. Eric became provost in 2014 after serving for five years as director of Argonne National Laboratory, one of the nation's largest science and engineering research centers, which has been managed by the university since 1946. Under his guidance, Argonne's researchers focused on solving the grand scientific and engineering challenges of our time, particularly the vital national priority of developing sustainable energy technologies. As the laboratory's director, Isaacs played key roles in creating the Institute for Molecular Engineering and expanding the impact of the Computation Institute, both joint efforts of the university and Argonne. He also worked to integrate Argonne more deeply into the scholarly life of the university through programs such as the Chicago Innovation Exchange and the Urban Center for Computation and Data. Please join me in welcoming Provost Isaacs. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. you really are an introducer. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. It's, it's great that University of Chicago can play, play such a strong role in making sure we, everybody understands what their place and, and, and visions for life. So first, I also want to add on behalf of the university my, uh, my thanks to all of you for your commitment to, to the university. So I've only been provost for 11 months, and one of the most remarkable characters you see when you talk to faculty, students, and alumni all together is this very common understanding of what Chicago is about and what ch Chicago can really do as an institution. And I think my job today really is to tell you where we are today, where we're going in the next five years, hopefully to get you really excited about what the place looks like today, maybe a little different than what you saw when you were at the university. And, and, and the one core value, of course, that we all speak to, that we all understand, is this core value of rigorous inquiry that has really been at the core of what we do, an innovation at innovative education and research. And so I'll speak to that a little bit. Our motto, Crescat Scientia, Vita Excolator, is really um, at the core, I think, in many ways of who we are. Let knowledge grow from more to more, and so be human life enriched. And what I really like about that is it starts off really with the emphasis on scholarship, on the emphasis on science, in, in some ways even education. But the second piece of that, and so be human life, life enriched, really talks about taking what we do in scholarship, taking what we do in education, and impacting the world, changing people's lives. And so what I think you'll hear today is a little bit of a story of some of the exciting things going on at our university. What I'd like to do is remind you first a little bit about, uh, about uh, our, how we're made, uh, our makeup. This is a, you know, a picture from the looking north uh, of campus, our beautiful campus. Uh, just to remind you, uh, many of you I know have, have been through each of these schools. We have five divisions in humanities, social sciences, in biological physical sci and physical sciences and of course the college, uh, but we also have eight schools, very proud of those schools in business, in medicine, in public policy, uh, in divinity, etc. And one of the keys, of course, to who we are is the fact that we have these, and if you talk to faculty at the university, if you talk to what you ask students why you came to the University of Chicago, they'll tell you it's not just having the disciplines, it's not just having this great educational system, they'll also tell you it's about these interdisciplinary or multi-program type of centers that we have across campus, and those have made a huge difference in how we think of doing our science, how we think about doing our humanistic studies. So those binding, that binding glue is what, is what really makes innovation possible at a place like the University of Chicago. So some of you may know who these two gentlemen are. I'm going to tell you a little bit of history. 
we have here uh, on your left is, of course, uh, it, Rockefeller. Um, and on the right is our first president, Harper. And the reason I think this is so important is, is, is it really took two great people with great vision, the one on the left with vision and, of course, a little bit of money, and the one on the right with tremendous vision about what an educational institution could be. In fact, his vision was really defining in many ways of what an institution today looks like, a, a research university looks like today. Um, one of the key things about the two of them together, and, and I want to say this with, without a tremendous emphasis, is their ambition. And this is just a quote from Rockefeller on Harper, which is, I gave him an unlimited budget and he exceeded it. And that's just the kind of ambition that, that we continually push through in everything we do. And I think everybody in this room understands what it means to be overly ambitious. And I think that's really what defines us. So, you know, with our, with our motto in Latin and with these two individuals really defining who we were, um, it, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. So, from the beginning, you know, we've been an institution that's focused on rigorous inquiry. And I would bet about half of you here from the college, the other half from the schools or, 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 graduates, or graduate students, this concept of rigorous inquiry is really who we are at our heart of hearts. And probably everybody here understands what that means. When you're entering undergraduate first year, you may not understand it. By the time you're in your third, third or fourth year, you clearly understand what that means and why it's so uniquely. And I'm going to actually read a quote from uh, President Zimmer. Um, which really emphasizes this. The University of Chicago, from its very inception, has been driven by a singular focus on inquiry, with a firm belief in the value of open, rigorous, and intense inquiry, and a common understanding that this must be the defining feature of this university. Everything about the University of Chicago that we recognize as distinctive flows from this commitment. And so that's really, I think, in a nutshell, how we all understand the university uh, and at its core, but in the end, of course, it's all about the people. It's all about, it's all about the students, it's all about the faculty, it's all about supporting them, ensuring that they have the best opportunities to be creative, innovative, and really, really change the world. And of course, that does continue to happen. This has um, you know, been, been our history, but here's a few recent examples of eminence and recognition. Uh, as you know, we have uh, 89 Nobel Prizes. Seven of those Nobel Prize winners are still on campus. Here's two of the most recent from a year and a half ago. Um, who, uh, Lars Hansen and Eugene Fama, who won it, uh, no surprise for economics. But uh, we continue to do these kinds of things. The four undergraduates here won this remarkable award called the Harry Truman Scholarship, which is given to students for their potential for really being transformational in public policy, in public service. These four, and it, we were the, the only university to get four of these, so it speaks to the quality of our graduate students. This woman here on the lower left uh, is a MacArthur Fellow, uh, Tara Zara, who's a remarkable historian of Eastern Europe. Very interesting individual, and she's won one of these Genius Awards just this past year. And then finally, and certainly only just a smattering of who we have at the university, um, is uh, Matthew Gensko, who, run, who won this, uh, this thing called the, the, the Clark Medal, which is given only to the top economists under 40. He won it last year, many of whom actually go on to win a Nobel Prize, though I'm not predicting anything here. But it's really nice to see this, and it's great to brag about it, but I want to emphasize that uh, the University of Chicago is not a place where people can rest on their laurels. It's not a place where people can, you know, lean back and be complacent. Uh, even Jim Heckman, who's one of our Nobel Prize winners in economics today, is building new, uh, is building new uh, institutes. He's building new ideas. In fact, just recently we're, we started building the Center for Economics of Human Development. So Jim Heckman can't come in every day and say, I want a Nobel Prize, I'm done. He has to come in every day and show what he's done lately. So it's really a great place in that sense. So what I'd like to do is start by just talking a little bit about the college, because I know at least half of you are alums of the college. And the main point I want to make is, is if you're here in the college in the 80s, 90s, what you would come and see today is actually quite different. And, and I'll come to go through some of the numbers here. But I want to emphasize that in addition to being continually committed to that rigorous education, the commitment to the core education, if you will, um, and this, by the way, this, for those of you that don't know, this is an image of Mansueta Library. How many of you have actually seen Mansueta Library? It's about, I don't know, almost half. It's a spectacular building. It was really about that commitment to scholarship. This was a decision. In fact, you're looking at this beautiful dome. All of the content of this library are underground in a very advanced system of retrieval for books. Uh, but what the decision was was actually to keep all of the manuscripts and books on campus, not move them off campus. Scholar wants a book, they can have it within 15, as long as it takes to walk across campus, you can get that book. That's different from all other universities. We decided to do this. 
We had a generous gift from the Mansuetos and we're able to do it. But it also serves as a great place for convenience. If you go by there, even on a snowy day, you'll see just like this, the place is filled with students who just love to go in there and, and study. So it's just an, a, great, a great show of that. Um, and it's also that commitment to, to scholarship. But one of the things that is changing, and probably those who are in the, in the college over the years know there's this commitment to scholarship, what's also changing is a commitment to professional development. We're spending more and more on things like Metcalf scholarships. Some of you may know what those are, where we take students and we fund them to spend a summer or even during the year, a quarter, working for a company or working for uh, the government. Uh, and we had 1,000 this past year, and we're looking to increase the number of Metcalfs. Those are incredible opportunities for our students to get out, experience real world. Some of them work in, for example, will work in a, in a congressional office. Some of them will work in companies around Chicago and even here in New York. We've also been committed to diversity. We have programs that are looking at not only, uh, not only financial diversity, but international diversity. Uh, and you, you probably know about the Odyssey and the No Barriers programs. All of them committed to broadening the student body, to increasing the, the breadth of that scholarship that we value so much, but also focusing on professional development. And finally, the thing we're also focusing a great deal on is student life. And uh, student life is something that maybe some of you didn't quite enjoy as much as you enjoyed the scholarship when you were students. That's changing. This is just one example. We're building a new, uh, a new uh, campus, uh, North, uh, North Residence Hall, which will be completed in 2017. It'll be on 55th Street and essentially be the gateway to the university. But what's interesting about this is it'll, it'll have um, a large number of students. I think it's on the order of about 400 plus beds. Uh, but it'll also be a life. They'll have, they'll have cafeteria there, they'll have stores there, they'll have essentially a whole community to build. So not only focusing, as I said, on scholarship, but also focusing on how we can really make uh, college great. The proof of the pudding is here. If you look at some of these numbers, it is a, an eye chart, I understand, but the numbers are amazing. We've, we've almost doubled, and this is probably the biggest change, the undergraduate population in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, but the things to pay attention to here, if you look at the admit rates, uh, we used to be 71%. So we had great people coming in. Now we're 8.75%. I was just up in New Haven yesterday where, you know, we're, we're at the same level of Yale, Harvard. We weren't there before. We're there now. Mostly because we have over 32,000 applicants every year, which we didn't have before either. So we have this very high, uh, I'm not, you know, these are just numbers and it doesn't tell the whole story, but the quality of students is, is remarkable. We have, you see the average SATs are, are dramatically up. Uh, and this is really all because of hard, very focused work of our admissions office and, and Dean uh, Jim Nondorf, as well as our, our campus and student life, and of course, Dean Boyer, who's the dean of our college, who spent a lot of time trying to understand how to really make something special. We're now ranked number fourth in U.S. News and World Report, head to head with uh, Stanford University. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I think you should all be really proud, not only to have been at the University of Chicago, but to know you've come from a place that is this remarkably powerful. Okay, that's the college, and I know about half of you are from the college, and we'll have a chance later to maybe talk more about it. But one of the things that I'm really here to do is talk a little bit about some of the exciting initiatives on campus. Uh, this is um, a chart that we put together, or these are essentially, if, I, if you can say it this way, these are essentially our campaign priorities. But the reason I show them in this way is that they really embody, in many ways, all the new and big, exciting things we're trying to do on campus in the coming years. And so I thought it'd be really worth thinking about or sharing some of these great and exciting uh, priorities uh, with you. Um, I will say that they're all very much faculty and student driven priorities. Uh, they will continue to be great for driving research and our preeminence in many areas, but also really important for training students. So what I thought I would do is just go through a few of these. I don't have a chance to talk about everything going on, camp on, on campus. It's really exciting, but I'll talk about a few and I'll start with because I am a physicist, I have to start with scientific discovery. So um, this, this has really uh, been at, at heart, heart and soul of what Chicago's been about since the very beginning. Uh, and in particular, where we have been preeminent is in astronomy and cosmology, is an area where you know, we do physics, chemistry, medicine. I just thought I'd narrate a brief history of astronomy at the University of Chicago. This happens to be a picture of Wendy Friedman, who we just hired last year as a university professor. We stole her from Carnegie, beat out other universities, She's basically absolutely one of the preeminent astronomers in the world, and you'll see in a minute what some of the, some of the stuff. So I'm going to go back in history again uh, to um, this telescope. I don't know how many of you know about Yerkes Telescope. When this was built um, back in the, uh, basically it was started in 1890s, so really at the very inception of the university, again a partnership 
between three people, and this time it was President Harper, who was our first president. It was George Ellery Hale, who was a young man at the time. He was about 22 when he was hired as a faculty. And, and, and in particular, the president worked really hard to get this guy to come and did. And then a gentleman named Charles Yerkes, who uh, had made a little bit of money with electric lines in Chicago. And they went to him, Hale went to him and said, do you want to build the, the most powerful telescope in the world? Um, and they did. This is a 40-inch refractor. Actually, it's still up in Wisconsin. You can go visit it. It's a Lake Geneva. And this, this telescope is responsible for some of the most important discoveries uh, ever in astronomy. And one of them being, uh, to underline the value, uh, the, the importance is, uh, is some of the work that was done by Edwin Hubble, another very famous astronomer, who for the first time in the early 20s identified the fact that the universe isn't made up of just our galaxy. He was the first person to see other galaxies and to understand using this telescope that the universe really is a composite of billions and billions of galaxies. So it was a very important dis machine for discovery, but it was also, again, that story of partnership between visionary scientists, visionary leaders in industry, uh, and, and of course, us administrators, meaning the president of the, of the university. So we have this legacy of leadership, but it keeps going. This is another example of a telescope it was built by John Karlstrom, one of our superstar cosmologists. One of the things that happened about 15 years ago in science was, if you look up in the sky and see the light in the sky, even 15 years ago we thought, well, that's most of what's out there. You look at all the stars and galaxies, we know about 95% of everything out there. Well, about 10 years ago we discovered, nope, it's the other way around. We only know about 5% of what's out there. 95% of it is all this mysterious stuff called dark energy and dark matter. It's telescopes like these which are applying those waters to understand what is this stuff out there. This is probably the most important question in science today. Is what's this stuff that the universe is made of? We have no idea. It's dark. So it's very interesting. And this telescope actually is, is in its second generation and we're looking to build third generation. It actually sits in Antarctica. So people have to go down there early in our fall. <laughs> And then they're stuck down there for the winter. But, so we send students to do that, of course. But, <laughs> but, but, but this is really a remarkable uh, telescope. And we keep doing this. This, again, you know, telescopes are a theme here. But because I'm talking about astronomy, this is uh, a, a telescope that's going to be built in Chile in 2021. I showed you Wendy Friedman. She's the director of this scientific leader of this whole program, one of the reasons we really wanted to get her. This is a telescope called the Giant Magellan Telescope. It will be the biggest telescope ever built on Earth. See these mirrors here, each of these? There are seven of them. Each of them is 8.3 meters across. It's 25 plus feet across. Each mirror, and there are eight of them. So the idea is that, seven of them, sorry. So the idea is that this telescope, when done, will be the most powerful telescope, 10 times more powerful than the Hubble. So what, what does that mean? And this is just one cool punchline. Today, when we look out at other stars, we know they're planets. We know they're planets because the stars themselves wiggle, but we can't see the planets. With that factor of 10 in power, we'll start being able to look at those planets. And what does that mean? Probably most importantly, we'll get to tell what kind of planets are out there. But really cool is that we can actually start looking at their atmospheres and determine if they're life-supporting planets. We can't tell that today. But we know where they are relative to their stars. But once you have that telescope, all of a sudden, we can start, you know, we may be able to determine that there's life on other planets with this telescope that's going to be in Chile. So it's very exciting, and we're in, we're in lead, we're at Chicago because of Wendy Friedman is leading that, uh, that interesting uh, project. One last thing I'll mention, just to give you a sense of scale, this huge telescope, it's a billion dollars. And when, when, I, when I see, you know, I, I'm, I, I you talk about Argonne, and I built this, we, we have this huge synchrotron, which is a billion dollar tool out at Argonne. When I went to one of their board meetings for this GMT, uh, the first thing I said is I congratulated them because now they are finally in real science, big science, because they, they're spending a billion dollars on an object. So, so um, the difference, though, between a synchrotron or argon, and argon's all federally funded, this is all going to be private funded, this giant Magellan telescope. So it's quite a different model for doing science. And the one last thing I'll say on science is that one of the things, if, if someone asks you what's really distinctive about Chicago, you know, of course, rigorous inquiry, our education, the other thing that's really unique compared to any other university is that we run two national labs. We just joined with a third marine biological lab. And we also have these remarkable research centers for biology. So if anyone asks you, you know, that is a really unique thing. These national labs together are over a billion dollars of research funds that the un university runs for the, for the government. MBL is probably one of the premier laboratories doing work on, for example, marine biology, environmental impact of carbon and nitrogen on the oceans, et cetera. A really remarkable place. The University of Chicago is very, very unique 
in doing this. There's only University of California that has the equivalent. Every other university doesn't do this. So it really gives us an interesting leverage point for, for who we are and what kind of things we can do. So I've mentioned a little bit about change. And one of the things I want to emphasize is this outward facing component to the university's scholarship, to the university's way of thinking that is changing. Historically, we were really driven by scholarship, really driven by innovative scholarship. But one of the things that's really changing a lot now is our thinking about how we take that scholarship and have an impact in the outside world. And so part of that story is, is directly related to the, the types of programs we are now developing in innovation for economic impact. This happens to be a picture which comes from a lot of work we're doing on 53rd Street. We created something called the Chicago Innovation Exchange, which is meant to be a hub for innovation, for entrepreneurship, for our students, for our faculty. We're bringing together uh, people from the Booth School of Business, people from the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship, as well as, uh, as, well as postdocs and, and graduate students and faculty to start thinking about and generating new companies. At the heart of innovation, you can't do innovation unless you have some form of engineering at a university. And so in, in the introduction, Matt mentioned that, that I had been involved in starting up this new institute at the University of Chicago called the Institute for Molecular Engineering. It's the first time we've had engineering on campus, aside from a lot of the work that goes on in, in, in the business, in, sorry, in, in the um, already has been going on in the medical center. This is really the first time we have engineering of any kind on campus. So this is transformative for us. Uh, this is just a, a picture of the kinds of things. So what distinguishes engineering from, from science? Science is you could call it blue sky. You're looking for discoveries, new discoveries. The difference with engineering is you have outcomes you're targeting. And so molecular engineering is taking the great science in chemistry and physics and medicine and applying it to outcomes. This example is just asking the really big question about clean water. Many places around the earth need clean water. And in fact, we talk about energy and oil being an issue. Water is equally an issue. If not, it will be a bigger issue uh, as, as, we, as the population on Earth grows. So how do you take water out of the ocean, desalinate it? You can do it today, but it's very expensive. How do you do this at a, at a much cheaper, much more effective at volume to feed, to feed the world's growth? So these are the kinds of big questions around uh, engineering that we're starting to ask as a result of molecular engineering. So in addition, so this is molecular engineering. In addition, we've started programs around campus that really help students get engaged in innovation. Uh, and this is a particular example from uh, something called the, um, the New Venture Challenge. So about 15 years ago, uh, Michael Polsky, who's a graduate of the Booth School, set up this Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship, which allows students to ideate, basically come up with business ideas and work with faculty who know how to think about business plans to start inventing companies. This one here, this one in particular, is called Matchist. Uh, they just won the challenge last year. They, uh, in particular, they're a company that, that helps other companies put together all the tools they need for businesses, right? So they'll put together all the online tools. Um, I want to say that, that, that this, this new venture challenge and this uh, Booth School program called the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship has generated a lot of companies. They've, they've raised over $355 million in venture funding. They've had over $3 billion in, uh, in exits and mergers, $3 billion, Grubhub being one of them which many of you may use in your daily lives. Um, but the point is that it's really giving students and faculty for the first time ever in the history of Chicago to really start thinking about creating companies and changing the way we do things. So in addition to having engineering school and having these programs in the Booth School, we also need a place for invention. And I mentioned to you in the first picture that on 53rd Street now, this is just a picture of 53rd Street here. On one side, or actually both of these buildings are now part of this thing called the, the Chicago Innovation Exchange, where companies can go, both from within Chicago, but from without. So we're encouraging companies from outside to come to 53rd Street because they can sit there with inventors. You can have inventors, you can have business people, you can have venture capitalists all sitting together in, in a way which creates the kind of ecosystem you need to get innovation to occur. This is brand new. We're just setting it up in the last year or so. And so we're now bringing together people who do chemistry and solar work. We're bringing together people who do, for example, this case in the middle here is batteries from Ar sorry, on the right-hand side is batteries from Argon, and in the middle is some robotics work that's going on in the physics department. So it's all very cool, and it's really for the first time that the University of Chicago is getting out there in this area of innovation. So I'm going to spend uh, just a couple minutes um, going over one or two more and then, and then be able to finish here. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I mentioned is, uh, is in, in that 
panel of, of, of campaign, if you will, themes is urban research and practice. And so if you think about University of Chicago, which is a great urban, uh, a great urban university in a great urban city, um, and, and one which has been doing urban research for many years, you can ask the question, how do you think of the bigger picture of urban impact? And so we're starting to really think about it. Um, this is a, a picture of a group of people, uh, which I think also Matt mentioned too, who work in something called the Urban Center for Computation and Data, which is trying to understand and analyze data from, from, from cities. But I, just, I, I won't spend a lot of time here. I just want to give you a sense of how urban science has changed over the years. University of Chicago, it turns out, is very famous in sociology and anthropology for being one of the first to invent a model for cities. Now, this model is very controversial. Uh, a faculty member called Burgess at the university years ago came up with a model, and his model was based in theory. And the theory that he based it on actually was Darwinian natural selection at some level, where he said cities were going to be structured and are structured around the fact of competition, like in Darwin that people compete for, mostly had to do with real estate, space, but also for water and food. And because of that competition, the obvious answer is you're going to have a very stratified structure. You'll have the poorest people in the center who can't afford to get out but, but have to live with the resources they have, and the wealthier will move out into the suburbs where there's more space. In his mind, the value was actually more space. And, and this was just a model, but it's a theory, and he applied it to the way the city. Now, the problem with this model is it's only Chicago, because if you come to even to New York, it's not that way. If you go to certainly Paris, you look at the suburbs actually are where a lot of the poverty is and the core is where the wealth is. And even in Chicago, that's changing quite a bit. But the point is that he, he came up with a theory and applied it to a city. Uh, as controversial as it was, it was a real theory. Today, though, it's all changing. And, and when you think about urban science, urban practice, it's really much more data based. So you can't just make up a theory and not test it. So we now have programs, many programs across campus. Uh, one of them is an example here called the Crime Lab, which actually takes either policy decisions by government uh, and tests them with real data, or vice versa, with the data and analytics says, here's a good policy that would work. This particular set of experiments I show here on the right have to do with decisions and the connection between education in the inner city and crime. And what, what, urban, what, the urban, what Crime Lab is able to do is actually measure what the outcome is. So there are just three programs. One, just for example, is called uh, summer jobs. It's maybe an obvious thing, but giving these kids in the inner city a job for the summer dramatically reduced the amount of crime, certainly over the summer, but even going into the following years. Another example is becoming a man. Some of you may have heard of that. It was actually President Obama's initiative. So the crime lab was able to go out and measure the effect of becoming a man, which was this very intensive support, mentoring and support for, for students in the, in the cities. Uh, helping them and then quantifying the, the, the change in crime, the change in, in recidivism, but also the change in graduation rates. And so just using data, it may sound obvious, was not something that was done in urban research. It's something that we're pioneering now at the university. And just to finish it off, I mean, the Crime Lab has been so successful, successful that just a month or two months ago, we, uh, we were invited to open up a Crime Lab here in New York City. So when you think about solving the problems in Chicago, those problems are not so different from the problems anywhere else in the world. And in fact, Chicago, New York, they're not growing. If you go to places like Beijing or Shanghai or go to India, those basically now, uh, those cities are expected to grow at unprecedented rates. And there we need to really understand how to apply some of these, these ideas. So um, one of the last things I want to talk about is intellectual destination. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, I think generally Chicago has been a place where faculty and students have, have flocked. But you know, we're on the south side of Chicago and we think about how do we, how do we become a, a place where, uh, where we want the best faculty, of course, we want the best students, of course, but also as an intellectual destination. How do we make sure that the best minds are coming, either in visiting programs or what have you? So um, we've started to build up our capacity for bringing in visitors to create very, very multidisciplinary environments. And this is just one example, uh, which is, some of you may have heard of the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society. It was, founding director is David Nirenberg, who we stole and we made him dean of the social sciences. Um, actually, Jonathan Lear, who's a, a very well-known uh, philosopher and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and actually psychologist as well, has taken over for David. But the point of the Neubauer Colleg Collegium is, first, from an intellectual point of view, something which humanists have not thought about historically as well as scientists, which is multidisciplinary solutions to big problems. So take the, take the problem of, of theft of, of archaeological, uh, archaeological sites in, say, the Mideast. 
that's not a problem that an archaeologist can solve alone. That's not a problem that, uh, that the government can solve alone. That's a problem that will take uh, e economists, business people, uh, l lawyers, uh, archaeologists, sociologists, a whole spate of people. This program will allow, uh, allow resources to be made available to bring those kinds of people to solve really important inc humanistic types of problems. And it's also starting to create uh, most, much like, if those of you know the Institute for Advanced Study, creating a place where the best scholars want to come to study and, and do the things they do. The other example, uh, when I think about destination, University of Chicago still has one of the absolute top uh, research programs and departments in economics, but we need to keep rethinking in how we do that. So what we recently did is, uh, is we took a, a, one of our, our uh, let's say, older buildings, the Theological Seminary, which we didn't own, Actually, I don't know those of you who remember what it looked like back in the day. Uh, and we took it and we modernized it, and it's now a spectacular home for economics, but equally important, something called the Becker Friedman Institute, which is also meant to be a very interdisciplinary economics uh, group who bring in people from all over the world and answer some of the most challenging problems in economics. So again, this is sort of thinking of us as a destination. And lastly, um, and I'm going to finish off in a minute here, uh, we're thinking not just about you know, Chicago or the University of Chicago as being the destination. We're thinking really carefully of what does it mean to be a global a university? What does you know, research mean in a global context? We all talk about globalization in business. We talk about globalization in research. What does it actually mean? And we're, we're looking at that. And one of the ways we're doing it, which is a little distinctive, as always, University of Chicago, from what other universities are doing, we are putting centers in various places around the world that are really designed for our faculty and students to go and learn where the most exciting things are happening anywhere. So right now, uh, a couple years ago, we opened a center in, in, uh, in Beijing. It was about three years ago now in Beijing. We opened a center about two years ago, or a year ago in Delhi, uh, which is now hosting many, many workshops and students and faculty, et cetera. We're on the verge of opening up. In fact, some of us are going over in March to Hong Kong to open a center in Hong Kong which will be anchored by the uh, executive MBA program uh, from the Booth School, uh, and on and on. I won't, I won't tell you about all the things going on. We have a, a center in Paris, which, as you can imagine, is amongst the most popular for our students. <laughs> and in fact, it's so popular that we're thinking about how do we expand that, because uh, we always have to turn away more than half the students who want to do that. So we're thinking all about it, but we also have, we retain this more, let's say, uh, fundamental scholar focus. It, for example, we still have what's called the Luxor House, used to be called the Chicago House, which is in Egypt. We have it. Um, you know, it's, it's become somewhat more difficult to get in and out, but we still have scholarship going on there. So we're doing a lot of these things to, if you will, globalize, globalize our engagement in a way that's uniquely Chicago. We're not out there granting degrees in, in, in for example, in Hong Kong, um, and, and bringing in local students, although they're welcome to apply, this is really to get our own students out there to make sure they understand what the global uh, problems look like. So with that, um, we really are uh, excited about having you here. This is a great launch to a campaign. Uh, these are the themes that I've sort of talked about. I didn't really have time to talk about culture and society. We have a major program now in art. We're really looking at how we take the court and the smart, the new Logan Center for the Arts, uh, and, think, and, and music and, and visual arts uh, and think about how the University of Chicago becomes a destination for some of the great art scholarship in the world. Um, and I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but the idea is that these are the big themes that are running through campus, the exciting things that, that hopefully you will get engaged with over the next four or five years as the campaign progresses. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you, and if there's time for questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Questions? Yeah. Can you say your name when you when you stand up? Just yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Could you give us any insight on the likelihood that the Obama Library will end up at the University of Chicago? Uh, certainly. <laughs> um, look, you know the, the the two main competitors here are right here in New York and Chicago. Um, you know, we're confident. We don't have any information yet about it. The, the competition's in, um, but we're confident because of the Obama's connection to the south side of Chicago, the commitment that the city has shown in, in, in dedicating uh, park, uh, park land for it, 
uh, and the type of proposal we wrote we think is a winning proposal. So we're confident, but I don't have inside information that it'll come. We can sit and speculate, you know, what it would look like if the president decided to come to New York. He might. Um, I would guess it'd be an appealing place for a young president to come after they, they get out. But, but in general, we're feeling pretty confident that, that, that it'll be a, a positive outcome for us. And then we can talk about what it means, of course, but yes. Uh, Tim Conley, MBA 80. Um, it was stated at the breakfast that this is the largest uh, caucus in the history of uh, the university. Um, and I was just curious your thoughts on uh, what caused that, and if you can't, if you don't know what the causation is, to what is it correlated? <laughs> A lot of hard work, that's why. I would just give all the credit to Damon Cates and, and, and Ken Minotti. Um, I, I do think uh, it's a great question. Actually, we should probably go around the room and ask the question, but I, I'll give you my answer. I think, first of all, there's a lot of excitement around the University of Chicago now. It, it, you know, it, it feels like to me, and I've only been provost for 11 months, that, that our outward face has become much more powerful. I think you know, in the old days, you'd go, in, you might go somewhere in this country and say University of Chicago, and many people would not really know what that means. Today, certainly every, everyone who's a high school student will know exactly what that means, and they'll be asking the question, how do I get in? So uh, I think really the, 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 the university itself has taken a much more aggressive and robust position on the national stage than it ever did before. And that sort of goes along from this very inward looking kind of a place to a very outward looking. It's not to say we didn't do amazing things in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But I do think that our presence in the world is really opening up in many ways, in part because of some of the things that I've, I've talked about. But I'd love to hear what you think. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I would do. But I don't know if we have time for that, so it's a question back. Hi. Looking at the statistics, um, it, what really struck me was in 1992, 72% of the applicants got in whereas now it's, I think, 8.75%. What do you attribute to that giant yeah. leap? <laughs> so part of it, um, again, on speculation, is self-selection. So it, it does have to do with the fact that the, the college is a much more now on the, on the scene at every high school, making itself available to many more students. Uh, and so therefore, many more students are applying. So uh, I don't know what the numbers were in 1992. I should probably have that on top of my mind. But we're now getting over 32,000 applicants which is a huge number of applicants because of the, because of the fact that the, the, the college itself is doing so well, not just in terms of, of recruiting, but also in terms of placement. So a lot of our kids are going off and getting great jobs. So it's just the, the college has taken a very, very directed and a very focused strategy to make itself a much more compelling place to be. It's not to say when, if you came in 1992, that it wasn't highly selective in the sense that it was self-selective. And that's my belief anyway, there were many fewer applicants. And people said, well, I'll go to the University of Chicago because I'll get a great education. And, and there's a great core. Everyone, you know, essentially Chicago invented that core and continues to be innovative that way. But, you know, again, I can ask that question around the room. Why did you come, if you came in 1985, why did you come in 85? But I think what's really happened is um, through very directed courses of action, we've become a much more uh, open and appealing place to many more different kinds of students. It's not just the only, the, you know, it's not, it, it, I think it's it fair to say that students who come to Chicago still come because they're really serious about, it's still a hard place to, to get a degree. But I think that the, the number of students who find it the place to come has just grown exponentially in the last 20 years. So there's, um, why don't we come over here and then we'll go in the back. Uh, following up on the previous question, um, Lenny Silverstein, class of 1966. <laughs> um, um, I saw that the number of undergraduates jumped, uh, I don't remember from what, but to 5,700. When I went to the UC, there were 2,000. So um, I'm struck that since half of us are uh, yeah. from the college, if you could talk about the quality, uh, how are you trying to maintain the quality of education uh, given the larger number of students? Yeah, thank you. So um, that's a great question. So first of all, of course, uh, we're teaching more 
courses than ever. And we're tailoring those courses to this larger body. The, the intent, the growth, you know, this started back in um, probably the, the decision to, to grow has happened back in the 80s, basically. Part of it was the, the reason we decided to grow in part was a sustainability issue, right? It's a small college uh, and a very large uh, research institute. And, uh, you know, people like Hannah Gray and, 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 and others in the past realized that that may not be sustainable in the long run. So you really need some, there's some need for scale. Um, in terms of keeping the quality up, right, it's, it's um, the culture, the quality of teaching at the university, as you know, is very high. We know how to do it. And so the question really is how do you scale it? How do you make sure you have enough classes? We still maintain, uh, by and large, partially because it's, we're part of the rankings depend on this, but we ret maintain many classes that are less than, that are 19 or fewer per class. We have some really big classes on the high end but we've maintained as much as we can the smaller classroom setting, which you know, we value, when you were there, we valued very much the teacher-faculty interactions. We still value that at our very core. So it was, as I said, it was a very calculated growth, basically, realizing that we had to do that. Part of it to compete against our peers, part of it was essentially realizing that you know, more balance between graduate and undergraduate would not be a, a bad thing, it would actually be a very good thing. And so that's why, we, so we have about, the next year we'll have about 5,800 undergraduates, which as you point out, is about twice what you had. But if you look at other universities, if you look at Yale or you look at, you know, Princeton or Princeton's small, but Harvard, some of the other ones, they're all quite similar. So we've kind of grown to be more like our peers, the Ivy Plus peers, um, while at the same time, I believe strongly we've kept that, the quality and we've hired more faculty. The other thing I'll say is that when, back when you were there, the quality was very good, so don't get me wrong, but when you double, and you have 32,000 applicants, you know, everybody is now an A-plus student on that list. It becomes very hard not to just admit A-plus students. So the quality of students is very high because we become a more attractive place. So the kind of students we're attracting is great. It makes the classes really energized and, and, and energizing for the other students. So one of the things that we've tried really hard to do is make sure, that's why we're keeping the classes at a real modest size. But the faculty, if you talk to the faculty, what do they like to teach? They love teaching the undergraduates now because these kids are like, you, know, you talk to these faculty and it, just, it blows them away how smart these kids are, right? So, so now you can say almost 100% of the kids in the classroom are just, are just scary bright. So it, it was a decision, really, I mean, as everyone says in the administration, none of us could have gotten in now if we had to apply to, to, to the <laughs> University of Chicago, which is, you know, it's an okay thing, I guess. But it's a really important, both of you asked very important questions, which is how do you maintain quality and grow? We didn't do it overnight, right? We took 20 years to do it. Uh, and, you know, we, we may or may not grow a little bit more. It really depends on, on you know, on, on many different strategic circumstances. But but I think we've done a really good job in keeping quality and adding additional program like professional development, like these Metcalfs, all these things that really make it a really holistic type of education. There's a question, there was a question in the back. Oh, okay, you, you pick them. Yeah, okay, good idea. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I noticed you didn't mention Fermilab. What's yeah. the future of that facility? <laughs> um, that was not an intentional uh, oversight. So, for, so just, just to, Step back a second. So the University of Chicago runs two Department of Energy laboratories. Fermilab, which is what we call a single purpose lab. It's just focused on high energy physics and that's it. And then Argonne, which is a multidisciplinary lab that does all kinds of things in the service of energy. So Fermilab um, actually has, uh, ha has some really good ideas for the future. One of the, the things behind your question might be that high energy physics in terms of machines, big machines, is now dominated in Switzerland by CERN. They have this very large thing called the Large Hadron Collider. And in fact, many of our, our own high energy physicists at the university go to CERN now instead of Fermilab. But Fermi has defined a different strategy which is quite uh, viable. They're in the middle of proposing it to the DOE. And if it pans out, they'll be doing great science in what's called neutrino physics um, with big accelerators and also uh, doing more of the astronomy kinds of things that I mentioned here. The one thing Fermi does really well is they build big instruments because they built these big, you know, they have this accelerator which is 6.28 kilometers around, 2 pi, you might notice, intentionally. And, and that, uh, that accelerator is a big instrument, big, important instrument. So they know how to build big things like big detectors for detecting dark energy and dark matter. So they're very involved in national programs doing those kinds of things. So they're flexible, adaptable, and I think they'll have a very good, strong future. Another one from this side. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe you, okay, you and then, then right. Uh, Chris Anderson from the Business School, so maybe this is an obvious question. 
uh, what can the 200 of us in this room do for the university? Huh. <laughs> Ken, do you want to say, answer that one? <laughs> Damon? Um, First of all, I think there are a few things you can do, obviously. One, I think that's really important is, is understand us well. I mean, the, even the Booth School, which, you know, it's changed over the years, it's, it's equally powerful. I mean, it's a great place, and, and, and the students there, the MBA students and graduate PhD students do very well. But I think the more you understand directions of the dean, directions of the school itself, and, and I think everyone in this room the, could, the more you understand Chicago, and you know, you can say f cocktail talk, but the more that you understand Chicago and can convey the excitement of what's going on, I think that really helps our, our brand. And our brand is very strong, but it's not known everywhere. You know, it's University of Chicago, it's not Harvard. So uh, we, we, we believe we're better than them in many things, including the business school. But I think you knowing what we do and how we do it is, and how we do it uniquely is a very important thing. And the other, of course, is, you know, consider giving. That's always a very important thing for us. I mean, that's, you know, that's what all the things I described today are only possible because of generosity of alum and, and trustees, et cetera. So I think those two things. But I am a strong believer that you guys are all emissaries for the university and continue to, you know, the more you know and the more you can convey of that to your colleagues and friends and how important it is and how great it is, the, I think the better for all of us. There was a question here. Um, Jessica Fulton, class of 2008. I just wanted to know if you could speak to, as the university expands, how is that affecting the relationship with the high bar community and the south side community yeah. in general? And, and what is the university doing to make sure that it maintains a positive relationship? That's a great question. So we, there are many things I can talk to on that. We, we just recently launched um, a whole new effort on campus uh, called civic engagement, and in fact, we hired from um, someone from the Obama White House to run it, um, um, who's a remarkable individual. We have worked really hard on engaging our community in, in many different ways, so I'll tell you what some of them are. Uh, and I think that, it, I would say it's safe to say that probably our relationship has never been as it is now because of the focus we're, we're showing. The first was the, the Obama public library question. I mean, we've worked, one of the interesting things about developing the proposal, it's certainly Chicago helped drive the proposal, but it's really a community proposal. The amount of outreach to the community was startling. I think, I think Derek Douglas and, and his colleagues were out over 150 times just talking to community groups. So just that engagement. So people just hear us and understand us. That's one thing we're doing. Um, the other is uh, we're focused on developing the South Side economically. And we're doing that in a number of ways. Uh, one of them is actually working with local businesses to help them become better competitors for Chicago business, for universities. You know, we, we, you know, we spend a lot of money in the neighborhood, and historically a lot of the, the service providers were coming from outside the neighborhood. So we have a program partially run out of Derek Douglas's office, which it engages and teaches people how to write better you know, re response to proposals, and that's another way we're doing it. And we're also directly, directly developing neighborhoods. So 53rd Street, how many of you have been on 53rd Street recently? And it's an amazing transformation. I mentioned the Chicago Innovation Exchange, but restaurants are coming, we have a Hyatt place. So we're looking for ways to help transform the neighborhood just by investing smartly, not, not infinite amounts of dollars, but just enough to, to convince, you know, because the University of Chicago is the major player on the South Side economically, so if you convince the business community that we're there to stay, we're there to stay as a university, but as an investor, they come. And then the last thing I'll say, I can go on and on, is around education. So education, you know, we've looked inwardly historically on education, but we've in the last 10 years developed the Urban Education Institute, which you may or may not have heard of. They actually run charter schools. They're one char University of Chicago charter school, there are four of them. And we're building a new one um, in Woodlawn. So it's, that's, that's well south of Midway, I think on 64th Street or 60, yeah, 64th. Um, and uh, and just off of Ellis, I think. So we're actually investing in not just economics, but also in, in, in the promise for people. I could keep going. We have all these programs. I would, I would say that if you talk to the mayor of the city, you talk to the aldermen in our neighborhood, they all think of Chicago as a different place. So I, th I, think, I, think, we're, I think we're really doing well on that, on that axis. That was a very definite and clear decision by the president, by President Zimmer, to make that happen. It's a good question, though. It's really important. So maybe one more from this side, and then we should, we should flip. Oh, I'm um, Jordan Sokolowski, the one from Macedonia. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for coming all this way. <laughs> yeah. So um, as the college becomes more competitive, yeah. um, how does the university ensure that groups like first-generation uh, college students 
um, are getting the support necessary to thrive yeah. in that high pressure environment? Yeah, that's another interesting question. So one of the things we've done in the last several years, um, so several years ago we created a program called the Odyssey Program, which was focused entirely on lowest income uh, families. So I think it's under $75,000 income and we were helping the, so those families ended up paying no, there were no loans, it was a no loans deal. Um, and, and of course the very, the very richest have no problem. The, the, this group you're talking about, you know, if, if we say they're in the lowest income, then there are programs for them. We've also recently created a new program focused on sort of the, the group you're talking about. People who have come here can, you know, can, do, can get by at some level, but can not necessarily be able to afford a $64,000 tuition room and board, et cetera, right, which is what everyone's charging these days. So we actually have a new program that's focused on uh, recent immigrants, but also even some more international students to help. Um, and the reason we think it's important is exactly as you said, right? You have these new immigrants, it helps the immigrants. It actually, uh, if you will, selfishly helps the other students. I mean, to have that kind of diverse, energized, and you know, a different set of, of, you know, this is what great scholarship's about, is different, diverse opinions. So we're really focused on this. In fact, it's a big part of, the, it's a big part of what, 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 what Damon and, and Ken are doing in terms of fundraising, is thinking about how do we help exactly that that sort of layer of students. So we're increasing our international uh, student body a little bit at a time, but we're increasing them a little bit. But we're doing exactly what you suggest is focusing on, because there's some great stories even of some, maybe we could go around the room and hear some great stories of first generation or even people who came from somewhere else and stayed because of the opportunity they got at the university. But it's a good question. So should we, I don't know, when, when do we have to stop? Five more minutes? Oh. Okay. Hi, Lisa Owano, AB 1981. I know we in New York send a lot of students to Chicago, and I assume that a fair number of them perhaps come back to New York City. I'm wondering, what can, New, what can we do in New York to support the university? Yeah, so in fact, our biggest single um, high school for, uh, for entrance into the college the last two years has been Stuyvesant. So it's in New York. <laughs> Stuyvesant? It, 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 <laughs> there you go. Well, it turns out uh, my wife and I have a cousin whose daughter was Stuyvesant. Now she's a, a second year at the University of Chicago. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's very interesting. So New York actually has, it's, by the way, this has all changed. This wasn't way in the past, but, but uh, New York kids are also paying attention. So what can you do? Uh, one, actually we heard, a, some, it was from last night, a woman who spoke, uh, this Metcalf program. One thing I would mention, it's a real concrete thing you could do. If you have companies, you have, you know, you have interesting opportunities for a summer student for say two or three months, I would encourage you to get in touch with us, with Damon Cates, and, and make it possible because these, these are the most, you talk to any kid who's had one, first of all, it's like life changing for them, but also gives them something great on their resume when they want to go on either to graduate school or get a job. So that would be one thing I would say you should do. Um, the other is, um, is uh, getting back to, uh, you know, we, we rely on our alumni to interview our students, and I would encourage you to keep getting involved in that way because we're always looking for, you know, when you, when you have 32,000 applicants, you need some reason to accept the, the kids who have straight A's and, you know, and SAT scores that are, you know, that are 1,600. So the more you can get involved in, in helping us identify the best and most interesting and exciting students. I don't know, do you have any other suggestions on what, no, okay, yeah. So I, make a gift, okay. Can, Director of, uh, of Alumni Relations says make a gift. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, I, I think the Metcalfs is one example of a very concrete thing, and it's, these kids are bright and really energized, so I think you'd probably find you get probably more than they get. So, question way in the back over there. Hi, my name is Angela from an SSA grad. And I'm interested in the global platform that you mentioned before in terms of the centers that university has. Any plans for other places, um, especially on the African continent? Huh. And then how alumni yeah. like ourselves that are interested can be involved in that you know, venture? Um, so, so, we, so first let me say we're always interested. We're looking around in the two places. We're partially limited by how, how expensive it is to, to build something overseas. Um, we have, as I said, we've, we've, we're in New Delhi, we've got Beijing, we're building Hong Kong. We're looking at, at two, new, two other places. Um, before I say that though, one of the things, and I can tell you exactly who you should talk to if you want to ha have more communication. We recently also, in addition to civic engagement, we recently started a new program in global engagement. 
and uh, we hired an individual, his name, a vice president uh, for global affairs or global engagement, and his name is uh, Ian Solomon. And Ian is, is amazing. So first of all, write his name down and contact him. He's at the university. He's thinking a lot, and I work very closely with him because the thing I'll say that's, and I kind of suggested it before, these centers are really faculty and student driven. They're really put in place because we have faculty who want to perform their research or scholarship wherever. So you ask about Africa, um, in fact, I've had a bunch of Africanists, the faculty, come into my office and say, what are we doing about Africa? We just hired actually a superstar economist into the Harris School whose interest is in African economies and the histories of those economies. We actually stole him from Harvard. His name is Jim Robinson. So we're expanding in that area and are very interested in scholarship there and also ultimately education. Um, we haven't decided if we're going to say locate, you know, go to Senegal and locate a center there because I don't think there's any one place like there might be in Beijing or Delhi, but we are looking at what we can do to accelerate some of our scholarship there. But if you really want to learn more and have interesting ideas, get in touch with Ian. He's really, um, he's really thinking a lot about these, these same issues. This will be our last question. Oh, okay. Hi, Glenn Waldorf, 1984, uh, bachelor's degree. Um, if tuition is 64000 and it increases around 5% a year in, in 10 years when I have an 11th grader, it, it's going to be $100,000 a year. What are you doing to just constrain the growth? I mean, you're trying to make the university as excellent as possible, I agree, but there's also yeah. a reality check for families. So Yeah. Um, we think about this every day, and, and I agree. Um, you know, the real question is, and, and uh, you know, you may, you may sneeze at me on this, but the real question is, what's the value of that education? We can have that debate. Uh, it likely will be that when you're 11, not when you're 11, how old is your, your? Oh, he's in first grade. So, do you, do you have a pre-tax account? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, first I will say this, and I, you know, just, just some, throw out some numbers. I mean, half the students that come to Chicago don't pay full tuition. So that number, you know, it isn't everybody. It's, it's really half, maybe even, it's even a little less than half with our new programs, Odyssey and the No Barriers program. Um, and, but it is a, a great concern, right? In fact, I was, yesterday I went to Yale and talked to the provost there and we had that conversation, which is, you know, what's your sense of all this? Uh, I do think that it's really, you know, cost control is a real challenge, but we look at it all the time. It's something we look at and we balance the value of that education against how much we need to spend uh, to, you know, to educate college students. I can't tell you I have an answer, because if I did, we would implement it and we would be the cheapest and best school in, in the, you know, in, in the union, but. It's not just Chicago, it's all schools. It's all schools, and, and so, you know, the, 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 there are several things going on. One is the, the cost of doing research is just phenomenal. Government's putting less into research, which is very important. Um, you know, if you look at even NIH, which has been our hero for many years in, in biological and medical research, is, is actually on the downward trend. Um, and at, at the same time, maintaining infrastructure, especially 125-year-old buildings, is very expensive. So we're always thinking about this. I know this is not the answer that will help you in, you know, in, t in 11, 12 years, but, but it is a real challenge for all of us to think about how we do cost control on these things. I, I don't know where the answer is, though. It's just, the other thing I'll say is federal regulation, which I don't want to sit here and complain about federal regulation. I have mixed feelings about it. But the, the, the size of the administration has to grow to handle everything going on. And it's, it's just an interesting phenomenon that's going on right now. I don't know where it's going to end up. Okay, I think that's it then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Provost Isaacs. Um, I'm Lauren Henry. I'm a graduate of the college and a member of the Alumni Board of Governors. Um, I also serve alongside Matt as a national co-chair for today's Volunteer Caucus. So I'm following Matt and the Provost, so I'm guaranteed to be the least interesting person you hear over lunch, but I do have the best job because I get to reiterate the thanks of the Alumni Board of Governors and the thanks of the Advisory Committee to all of you for being here today on this snowy, possibly later icy, nobody really knows day, um, but also for all of the work that you do the other 364 days of the year. 
Um, as we heard the provost say, it really is a transformational time for the university and the work that you all are doing for, with prospective students and current students and their families and alumni and the entire community is absolutely critical to everything that's happening in Hyde Park and around the world and even uh, apparently in like across the universe. Um, so that's very exciting. So to that end, we really hope that you will spend the rest of the afternoon continuing to broaden your knowledge and your network um, here at Caucus. Um, I also get the distinction of reminding you about the survey for maybe the third, maybe more than the third times. Um, it's definitely important, particularly to me, because I will be working on caucus 2016 um, to hear your all's feedback, hear what you thought. So definitely volunteer caucus.uchicago.edu. Take a minute um, on your train home or your plane home or whatever delay you have to take the survey. Um, <laughs> And finally, just as a reminder, we really hope that today is just the start of a conversation among all of you, among you and your colleagues in the organizations for which you volunteer in your local communities. Please take the knowledge that you get here today from these amazing volunteers from each other and take it back home and use it. So with that, like I said, I just get to say thank you and send you on your way to a really exciting afternoon with each other. So thanks. <laughs>